April 10th, 2021. If you can kneel, please kneel. We're going to begin in prayer. Father, thank you once again for delivering us into another day of rest. Thank you for the peace you bring. Thank you for the comfort and stability you give us. We pray whenever we are scared, fearful, paranoid, whenever we are anxious or nervous, that we would rest comfortably in you. There's no reason to worry. There's no reason to panic or anything. So long as we rest in your love, all things work. All things work out. All things are great. Life can be lived abundantly. So, Father, please, teach us to obey. Teach us your truth and have us to live by those truths. Thank you, Father, for blessing us beyond measure and giving us a time where we can worship you. We pray that only your truth would be spoken and heard. And, Father, as we learn of you and we learn of love, we pray that we would never separate the two because you are love. Thank you again for bringing us together. And we pray that we would live this Sabbath day with no guile in our mouths, and no contention, or strife, or anything, but that we would unite under the banner of faith. As best we can, we make these prayers to you, Father, in the name of your only begotten Son, our returning King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hold on. Okay, um, today is part two of love from 1 Corinthians 13. Um, the first part was a couple weeks ago because we needed to we needed to talk about Easter last time. Uh, but yeah, and the way this is set up again is that we're going through 1 Corinthians 13, at least the main section where you know where it's talking about. Charity is this, charity is that, but, you know, charity just means love. And a couple of weeks ago, we went through love is patient and love is kind, because those are the first two things there. And uh, the way this is structured, the way we talked about last time, was that everything, um, every characteristic of love which we discuss is a character trait of God himself, because you cannot separate love from God. The only way to know love is to know God, and um, the only way to serve him fully is through love. I mean, you can't, you, well, you can't serve him righteously without love. I mean, everybody serves God, including the atheist. Everybody in some way, shape, or form serves God. There's no sort of, there's not this you know, imaginary group of people that do not serve God. Everybody serves him in one way or another. The only question is, what sort of vessel are you? Are you a vessel of gold and silver, or are you not? Are you a vessel used for other things? Either way. Um, and by the way, that is something that really hit me hard, because I was under a delusion for most of my life that, oh, I so long as I don't concentrate on God, or as long, if I put faith to the side, then I can live my life and that'll be that. And then I, I can escape something. I don't know what the delusion was about. All it was was to get me to not read the Bible and not follow God. That's all it was. But understanding, and I have no idea where the verses are right now, but understanding that we are all in service to God, that really um, hit me hard because it showed me that I can't quote unquote escape. Like I'm going to serve him. The only question is how am I going to, in what way do I want to, if it's going to be the case, which it is that we are all going to serve him, then our only choice is how are we going to serve him? I mean, being alone in being alone in the mountains by yourself in a forest with no human interaction doesn't mean you don't still fall under the 100% fact that you are going to serve him. The only question is how. So it's, it, again, it's never a question of if you're going to serve God, it's just a question of how. I mean, even the, uh, for example, even the, the atheist and the evolutionist, 
they still serve God. How? Well, talking to them finally moves a lot of people into studying the scriptures to see if they're right. So even though the atheist and the evolutionist don't believe in God, their arguments compel a willing heart to search the scriptures, to search the sciences, and, to, and through that, through that compulsion that God has used through them, he can bring other souls to himself. So even the atheist and evolutionist serves a purpose in bringing people to God. They just don't, they don't see it that way. And then that's fine. Just, you know, if that's how they want to live, and that's, you know, you know, we all have a choice in this matter. But, yeah, the way, so always remember as we go through this that every characteristic of love is a character trait of God himself. And that's what we, those are going to be the first verses for every part of this. For example, the next thing we're doing in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13 is, uh, well, how it's said how it's said in here is, um, hold on, where am I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, charity envieth not. So, love does not envy. Because uh, envy runs contrary to the will and character of God. And if you, uh, if you understand your commandments, you know that envy is commandment number 10. It's so to envy, in other words, to be jealous, uh, jealous of what your neighbor has, you know, envying what someone else has, envying, even just in a general way, envying or being jealous of somebody else's life, like in a very general way. Um, you really, I remember when I was young, anytime I was getting all flippant, I would think like, Oh, I wish I just had so and so's life. It would be so much easier. The grass is always greener when you don't know what's going on on the other side of the fence, right? But as soon as you hop over, you find out it's a big giant pit. You know, because everybody's life, everybody's family has their problems, but that doesn't mean you should envy or be jealous. So, as far as commandment number 10 is concerned, how it connects to love does not envy. Let's just read commandment number 10 real quick, which is in Exodus 20 verses, I mean, verse 17. Exodus 20, 17 says, Thou shalt not covet, they use word, um, God uses the word covet here, same thing. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So God does give a short list there, but then he says, Thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. Nothing. Not even, like, um, the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing, that's, that's a fine example of coveting or envy or jealousy. And, um, it's a, it's quite selfish too, because how can, how can I make myself seem like I have just as much as so-and-so? Like, who cares? Who cares if they have a bunch of cars or a bunch of lawnmowers or snowmobiles or whatever? What does it really matter? That's a, that's a point of pride, though. And by the way, we'll get to that in a one, two. Two after this is love is not proud. But so you see that envy actually falls into the commandments directly. But how is this a character trait of God? Well, Galatians 5 Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. Again, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21 say, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. So these are the works of the flesh, the things that are bad. The works of the, uh, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, uh, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, being envious or covetous or jealous of what someone else has is, um, uh, yeah, that'll keep you out of heaven. Now, some, uh, the devil will try to use technicalities here in, in our minds by saying, oh, I'm not jealous of anyone in particular stuff. I just wish I had more money to blah, blah, blah. Isn't that being envious? 
it's the same thing. Just because it's not connected to an individual doesn't mean it's still not envious. Uh, and again, envy runs contrary to the will and character of God. Why? Because God tells us to be what? Content. God tells us to be content. Therefore, if we are envious of a different life, if we're envious that we don't have what we think we ought to have, see, that's the root of it. I believe that I should have this. I believe I should live this kind of life. I believe I should have, you know, you know what I'm saying. That whole line of thought, it, the, it's entitlement. It's like, I am, I am entitled to have this lot in life, not the lot in life that God has given me. So being envious directly, uh, directly contradicts the will and character of God because he tells us to be content with what we have. And we're told this a few times. Uh, for example, in Philippians 4, verses 11 and 19, for those of you that love when I do that. Philippians 4, verses 11 and 19. First verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So in whatever state we're in, you know, wealthy, poor, have a car, don't have a car, have a change of clothes, don't have a change of clothes, I've eaten today or I haven't eaten today, content. Content, because what does Jesus say? For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, it's not even about whether we ate today or not. Or in the past couple of days. By the way, God knows, God knows your limits. If the time ever comes where you don't eat for a day or two, he knows that you can handle it for a day or two. It doesn't mean he won't feed you. It means he... The, he knows your limits. He won't let you go beyond them. So long as you walk with him. Because we have that promise in, where is it? First Corinthians. Was it First Corinthians? Ah, oh, of course. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. First Corinthians 10, 13. First Corinthians 10, 13 applies to believers. Applies to believers. Not everyone. It applies to believers. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Praise the Lord. And thank you, Lord, because I truly didn't remember where that was. So God never gives us more than we're capable of handling. That's why those of us... Um, like when we fast, God doesn't make it grievous to us. We enjoy it, you know, because we're getting closer to them. It's like, it's like you're cold and you're wrapping up in a big fluffy blanket, right? It, you don't, the pains of hunger don't actually hurt. And when you're walking with God, this stuff just, you know, the pain just rolls off of you. So the point is, whether you eat today or you don't eat today, whether you have anything at all, or you have everything, you have every reason to be content. Because if you walk with God, you have everything. That's why, uh, that's why Paul was moved by the Holy Spirit to say that in particular at the end of at the end of verse eleven, where uh, oops, wrong one, uh, where he says, "In whatsoever state I am, there uh, therewith to be content." And then he goes on later on in the same chapter, Philippians 4.19, when he says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Again, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So he'll always supply what we need. The issue is never, ever, ever, ever a case of need. It's always a case of want. But Lord, I want a different life. But Lord, I want a different car. But I want a different way of living. I want to dress a particular way. I want to speak a certain way. I want to run my life. I want to make my decisions. I want to have these people as friends. I want this. I want that. I want, 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 want. That is the true issue. Self-centeredness. Selfishness. 
making it all about the self and the personal desires. That is the true root of sin itself. If you really think about sin and what it is, it all stems from selfishness. I want this. I want to say this. I want to think this way. I want to believe this way. I want to, I want, I want what I want. That is the root of sin. Because when the concentration is actually on God, there's no room for what the self wants. Right? When it's all about God, just like, um, uh, just like when you're a parent, everything is about your kids. That's what, I mean, first you go into marriage and you have to sacrifice about 50% of who, of the things you used to do. It's about give and take. There's a sacrifice that's given when the, uh, for the relationship itself. And then when you have kids, there's even more of a sacrifice. And that's why you get people who have midlife crises. What do you think that is? Because the, typically the guy, but women go through it too, but mainly men. They see that I've given up everything for my wife, I've given up everything for my kids, I've given up everything for my job. It's time for me to have, to be a teenager at 45. That's where the midlife crisis comes from. Sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. And so the, the problem, the problem is never about need. For our God will always provide us everything we need. The problem is when our wants run contrary to our needs. Then we see life as grievous. We see life is not worth living. We walk away from the love that God has and God is as he gives us our needs. We think that he, that it's not enough for some reason. For instance, I personally want a five acre garden. Now I can choose to be upset with God for not giving me what I want. Or I could see that, hey, there are only so many hours in a day. There are only so many dollars in the account. There are only so many C's. There is only so much work that can be done. And what does it matter if I have five acres if four and a half fail because I'm not paying attention to need? But in, the, but in the space of one acre or two acres, God can provide 10 acres worth of food by just making it to be abundant. And so you see that even when it comes to how God, how God provides, he'll, he'll just make it happen so long as you walk with him. I've, I've watched several videos of these gardeners in a quarter acre, in a quarter acre of space, they were able to have almost an entire year's worth of food. Why? Because they did things wisely. They did things according to need. Now, I'm not talking about Christians here. All I'm, all I'm saying is that God provides the abundance to prove a point, to show us how things can be done. At the same time, if, that, if those people with a quarter acre worth of land, if they don't get with the program and start loving God, then those crops can fail and fail fast. All I'm talking about is that God will always provide our needs. And I personally believe he allows those things to happen, like the quarter acre worth of food, to show us what he's capable of. To teach us that it doesn't matter how much space you have, it matters what you do, what you do with it. And for us specifically, believers, it's about how closely we walk with him and not envying what other people have. Because God will truly provide everything. And in 1 Timothy 6, what did I write there? 1 Timothy 6, 8. In 1 Timothy 6, 8. Um, yeah, we know this one. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. You have everything you need. So why do we fall apart when we have a thousand times more things than food and clothing why do we still think life is terrible? Life is horrible. My house isn't big enough. My car isn't fast enough. My clothes aren't stylish enough. My hair isn't pretty enough. My body doesn't look the way it wants. It's like we have to find problems. You know you are truly entitled when you have to look for problems. You don't have any real problems in your life. You eat every day, but somehow it's not good enough. Right? You have clean clothes to wear, or even if they're dirty. You have clothes to change into. And yet, you know, complaints. So what I'm talking about is that envy is like a virus. It's very, it's like a virus that penetrates 
to the very core of who you are. And with envy, when if there's envious, enviousness in our hearts, nothing is good enough. Nothing is happy. Nothing is pleasant. Nothing is is positive. Now, I'm saying nothing as an absolute, but you know what I'm saying. It, to varying degrees, depending on how much envy is in someone's heart, they can wake up with an attitude of maim, kill, destroy, because everything sucks. Or it can just be 90% of everything. You know, they've we can find a reason to smile in the day, but generally speaking, everything is some shade of terrible. But imagine being content. Then everything's great. Every piece of food tastes good because you're happy that you have it. And as far as clothing is concerned, so long as it meets the standards of God, especially for women, then you're just happy that you have clothes. Does that have a hole in it? Sure. <laughs> So, I mean, as long as it's not a big one that's bearing, you know, your skin or something. You know, I'm talking about being reasonable. But remember, envy means jealousy. And just like God said in commandment number 10, being jealous of someone else's uh, husband or wife, right? That t that will typically break a relationship. When co when you compare your spouse to another person, you are going down a road of divorce. You will destroy the relationship long before the divorce because you'll always be critical. And make no mistake, the devil will exaggerate your loved one's failures and inadequacies. He will make sure that your view of that uh, of your spouse is tainted, corrupt, and gross to the point that you may not even want to touch them. And you you definitely have trouble speaking kindly to them. The devil will absolutely sow suspicion and jealousy, and he'll indulge your self-pity and insist that you deserve something better. The devil will always magnify the faults of your spouse. Because he knows the covenant of marriage is, it was, that institution was put into place at the end of creation week. Like, it's part of creation. I mean, you have the seventh day Sabbath, and you have a marriage between one man and one woman. Those were the only two uh, institutions that were made at the beginning. So he has to corrupt them both. And he'll make sure like, oh, my, especially on the part of men. You know, I'm not trying to pick on myself or, or men, but you know what I'm saying is true. Men will be like, oh, she, uh, when we first met, she could wear a double zero. Now she wears <gasps> a six. Or something, you know, it's always something dumb. It's always something superficial. It's always something that is totally and completely meaningless. And if your love is affected by a physical trait, then I doubt the love was truly there in the first place. Because love, no, love, th this is what we're talking about. This is this whole sermon series. What love is. And if you're envious over some other guy's wife, then where was the love in the first place? If your love can be so destroyed to the point of unfaithfulness, because there's a lot of cheating, there's a lot of infidelity that's going on, then where was the love in the first place? And you see, since envy means jealousy, we know that jealousy, jealousy is terrible absolutely terrible and it breaks even friendships have you ever been in the position where you have your best friend then you see that your friend has another friend and you're like oh, i'm your best friend even that jealousy exists i know i've i've been there like why why is he talking to so and so like, i thought we didn't like him like, we have one mind i thought we didn't like him but you know, the devil's a tricky, tricky guy. As far as the jealousy is concerned, we see what jealousy does to people. Let me give you two examples from Acts. In Acts 7-8. 
in Acts 7, verse 8, it says, And he, uh, sorry. Yeah, Acts 7, 8. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. I think I wrote this wrong. Mm, okay, I messed up that one. Let's go to the second one. I'll try and find it later. X, uh, let me make sure this one's right. Okay, this one's right. Acts 13, 45. Acts 13, verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So being envious that Paul was attracting all these people to the truth, they, you know, that's where their anger was was really from. Just jealousy. What is a way that we can combat envy? It's a very simple, there's a, an extremely simple way to combat envy and jealousy and covetousness. List your blessings. Seriously, make a list. We all have notebooks. We all have paper. We all have writing instruments. Write down your blessings. This is not a pros and cons list. This is a pros list. Because when you walk with God, everything is a pro. Everything is good. The only reason we can see negativity in our lives is when we're seeing things through the devil's perspective and not seeing things through God's perspective. So we have limited sight and we see ourselves as, oh, what is running this world right now? Victim mentality. I'm a victim because of this. I'm oppressed because of this. I'm blah, blah, blah. So therefore I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be upset. My life isn't worth it because I'm lacking this or lacking that. But the only thing we can lack and truly be in a place of despair is God. But you can lack everything else in life and be perfectly fine so long as you're with him. And that's the plain and simple truth. But there's, there's another way that we can combat um, enviousness. And to see that, let's go to Philippians 2, 3 real quick. In Philippians 2, 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So what does this mean? How does this com combat envy? Be happy for other people's good. If they're experiencing some sort of good, they've experienced, oh, oh, actually, there's a, there's a form of this that can um, really tear you apart. If somebody else receives, say, a financial windfall, jealousy really kicks in at that point. But instead, say how glad you are for them. Tell them that that you're happy that they've uh, that they've received this, but it doesn't just have to be with um, with money. Oh, who was it? Um, uh, Leah. Was Leah the one who was like, after she saw all the babies being given to her sister, she was like, "Give me a baby, lest I die." Envy. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah, envy, jealousy. That's what led her to say that. And then the rebuke came quick. Am I in the place of God? So jealousy, even because someone else has a baby and you don't. Jealousy can come in any way, shape, or form. So long as somebody has something and you don't, the devil will exaggerate that and cause you to believe your life is terrible. Or say you're on the verge of some sort of handicap. Or you are handicapped in some way. Like, oh, look at, the, look at those young people running around like they own the place. Just because you can't run around like, you were, like you're in your youth doesn't, doesn't mean you're lacking. It just means they're youthful. Seriously, being jealous of life itself. Thinking somehow it's unfair. Yeah, the more you think about jealousy and envy and covetousness the more you see how it's woven into the fabric of society. Even the, look at the, 
when you're talking about commercials, TV shows, and things like that, understand there is a tremendous amount of study that goes on to make those things to, as psychologically impactful as possible. Every word, every image, every way that something is said is meant to cause you to react in a particular way. Add on top of that the layers of hypnotism through flashing lights, moving shapes, um, and things like that. Commercials and TV shows are 100% by design. And they are designed to cause you to think, feel, believe, act, and speak in particular ways. It's hypnotism to the core. Why do I bring this up? Because look at, um, say, a makeup commercial. They're not showing unattractive people. They're showing some of the most attractive women they can possibly find. Why? To make you feel inadequate. To make you feel like you're not pretty. To make you feel like you're out of shape and to cause you to be resentful and to hate yourself. And the only way to be pretty is to go down this route that this commercial or show or magazine has told me. Or look at the movies where their stories by design, especially the action-packed ones, are meant to teach us what, uh, what judgment means. What it means to love your family, right? Because what do you see? What are a lot of the, the core concept in a lot of movies? How dare this person hurt my family? I'm going to get retribution. And don't tell me that that, that, has, that hasn't impacted the way you think. Because if you're not grounded in the Bible, you're, gr you're going to be grounded in something. So if your life is lived in front of the TV, then that's where you're getting your morals. That's where you're getting uh, your belief system. And in the end, it's to cause some sort of jealousy, some sort of division. Like, this person has this, why don't I? Really, we could go on with envy for a long time. But we're not. I just urge you to do a study on the subject. It's going to run basically the, your whole life. Because every part of your life can be tainted with envy. Just remember in the end. That envy is part of the Ten Commandments, which means falling into it is sinful. It is a sin. But contentment is the opposite of envy. So we can, we can start the second one, but we'll go on a break in a few minutes. The second part... Oh, I'm not even on the page. In uh, 1 Corinthians 13, still verse uh, 4, by the way. Because 1 Corinthians 13, 4 lists several things. All right. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Just did charity, envieth not. All right. The next part says, charity vaunteth not itself. <laughs> What's the plain English of that? Love doesn't boast. It doesn't vaunt itself upwards. Sorry. I just... Whenever, whenever I read that, I get British for a second. So, love does not boast. It doesn't have a boastful personality. Um, I guess by example, all these people who give to charity, and they say, I gave this to charity. Like, why are you boasting? That's a loving act to give somebody something, or at least to think you are. But then why are you talking about it? You know, if somebody asks you, then... Sure, answer honestly, but answer humbly. But if you're just open with it, like, I gave uh, to this and that. Stop boasting. Like, leave that between you and God. Somebody Again, if somebody asks specifically, then sure, answer them. But that sort of information doesn't need... It doesn't actually have a requirement to be talked about. In, in a safe group, when we're asking, did I give in the right way? Sure, that's fine. That's fine, because you're actually looking for the proper path. You're looking for more information. You're looking for a better way to serve the Lord. And that's not boasting. That's, that's searching for clarification. For example, if somebody came here and they said, well, I give to this charity every year, I'd say, you obviously have a loving heart to help people. 
but it's really recommended to not give to a charity. But if you want to help somebody, help somebody firsthand. Meet their needs in person. Because these charities are corrupt. You know, they claim this much goes to this person, but how do you know? And not to mention giving to a charity, those are 501c3 organizations. And you can, you can uh, have that money returned at the end of the year. So it doesn't even count. Just like when somebody tithes to a 501c3 church, they can get that money at the end of the year. So they don't have a true separation from their tithe. So, so boasting, boasting can, boasting again is all about the self. It's look what I can do. But there are, there are safe ways to boast. Well, Allow me to clarify. First of all, let's go to Psalm 10.3. Psalm 10, verse 3 says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. All right, so isn't that, like, uh, praise the Lord. We were just talking about envy. Now we're talking about boasting, and now they're both in one verse. And God is putting it in the sense, in the, um, in the vein of them both being evil. So again, uh, Psalm 10, 3. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. Have, me and Christy, we were bad about this before. When we were talking about like, why hasn't God given us our millions? He knows we would do good with it. He knows that, uh, sure, we would have the, this incredibly expensive house on this incredibly expensive property. But besides that... All the rest would go to feeding people and make, we had all sorts of plants and we would talk about it to people. Essentially, we were boasting of our heart's desire, but framing it in a virtuous way. You know, I just want to make people happy by showing them my pretty flashy car. Like, oh, I just need a facepalm. That's some of the thoughts that I used to have. Like, I have a desire to help the poor. I have a desire to lift people out of poverty. I have a desire for this. Okay. But what does God have in plan, have in store for you? What are your, what are the plans that he has? I get that that's what you want to do, but what will he have you do? There are many men out there, and unfortunately women, who desire the post of a pastor. But is it for you? That's a good thing to want. That's a good desire to have. But is it for you? Is it something that God wants for you? That, again, it, it's really good. And I commend you if you have that desire. But is it what God wants? For women, it's a no. Okay, so that just needs to get out of the picture. You're not going to be a pastor. Not in God's eyes. You have people like Joyce Meyer and all them where, you know, they hold a position where they have no right. There's a church here where the pastor's a woman. Down the street, not too far. The only reason I found out about that was because somebody I used to talk to. And um, uh, he was having a problem. He's like, well, my pastor says this. I'm like, who's your pastor? He's like, oh, well, she... I'm like, okay, stop there. And, uh, yeah, we had to talk about that for a while. But also in Psalm 10.3, as it says, you know, the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, but it says, and blesseth the covetous. Oh, look at him. He has all this. He can, you know, he can do, look at him wasting his money. If I had his money, I would do this. That, that's not a way to speak. And by the way, that whole idea of this person doesn't deserve what they have. I would do better with it. That's socialism. <laughs> That's socialism. That's wanting to take from what somebody has because you think that you deserve it. That's socialism. So if you didn't think that you have a socialist mentality, you do. For example, um, when, the, uh, when people started losing their jobs uh, because of this pandemic, and uh, those who lost their jobs, they were receiving... Uh, they were receiving government money, right? Remember all that? That was during the early stages. There were people actually saying, I should get money too. Like, all right, but you're on social security. 
You're on welfare. You didn't lose your job. You didn't lose anything. Why are you envious over what these people are getting? They actually lost something. Well, I should get a piece of it too. Why? No, you shouldn't. Your payment didn't stop. But that's how jealousy works. That's how envy works. Like I, I would do, you know, I would do better with that money too. And so it was really ridiculous. And then there's this truck that comes here that delivers food, I think, once a month. And there are people going there. They didn't lose their job. They didn't lose their income. They're going and getting a box of free food. Why? Because it's free. They're not checking IDs. They're not checking your income. So there are a lot of people who line up at that thing and they're getting food that they don't need. They're taking from the poor to feed themselves. And so boastfulness and envy can work with each other. But in essence, what we learn from Psalm 10.3 is that esteeming the self is a bad thing. Look what I can do. Or even boasting. Uh, here's an example of where boasting and envy can come in the same breath. Uh, when I was young, I used to be able to run this fast or bench this much weight. I wish I was still there. That's, yeah, that's, first of all, it's boasting of what you could do, but it's also envious over something you've lost. So that's how, in one sentence, you can, you can violate the idea that love does not envy and love does not boast. Now, by contrast, what is a good way to boast? There is a good way. Boasting in and of itself is not bad. It's just, where is it directed? Well, in Psalm 44, 8. In Psalm 44, verse 8, it says, In God we boast all the day long, and praise thy name forever. Salah. So again, Psalm 44, 8. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever so long because it's not well it is it is boasting but in a worthy direction you cannot ever overestimate or overstate the things that god has done the reason you can't overstate it is because we only have a small bit of understanding for the things that he's done we say god created everything but then you get into the details and the details and the details and you could speak forever all day, 24-7, every day of your life, and you still won't come to the smallest fraction of all he's done. So boast of him because he deserves it. And you're not boasting of yourself in the process. That's why when you hear people talking about what's going on in their lives and they're believers, they will, God will always place it in, God will also, sorry, God will always place it in us to give credit to the Lord. Right? We'll always say that, well, the Lord did this for me. God did it. He's given me strength. He's given me courage. He makes sure that I have this knowledge. He's given me the wisdom. He's done this. That's how a conversation is supposed to be. Not giving credit to the self, but giving credit to God. Because giving credit to the self is boastfulness. By the way, if you're uplifting someone, it's not wrong to say, hey, you're doing this right, you're doing that right. It's not wrong to say that. Now, it's wrong for them to say, oh yeah, I did that, <laughs> without giving credit to God. But we are supposed to uplift each other. You know, be happy for their good and what the Lord has done for them. Now, it's even better to phrase it differently. Like, wow, it's obvious the Lord has given you strength. It's obvious that the Lord is working in you. Yeah still uplifting but it's not it's not a bad thing to say hey you're doing you're doing great because that is acknowledging that the choices that somebody is making is in a godly direction that's why it's not necessarily a bad thing to say that somebody is doing well because in the end we all have the choice right i mean sin exists because of bad choices okay so we are going to take a break right now and we'll be back in just a few minutes okay going on with uh, love does not boast so we see that esteeming the self bad 
esteeming God good. All right? Lesson learned. <laughs> Is your door open? Let's go to Psalm 49, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 49, verses 6 and 7. They that trust in their wealth, and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. This is a direct, direct rebuke upon those who basically treat money as their savior. Like, so long as I, as I have enough, I'll be able to make it. Because that, that really is a statement which goes against the power of God. Only God can save, not your dollar bill. Only God can feed you, not your money. Y like, yes, given we do buy our food with our money but that's not to say that god won't feed you anyway okay look at the person who through good works good words and you know their general love and hospitality and giving nature develops a reputation where they live a reputation for godliness goodness humility and all that well i mean that actually can be the thing which God uses to make sure that you eat. Because everyone will remember how, uh, everyone will remember how God worked generously through you. Now, the opposite is also true. What if you're seen as the greedy, penny-pinching, um, not wanting to do anything for, uh, for any one kind of person? That's an extreme example, because even the most selfish people will still do one or two things for someone. But, if you're known as somebody who is unthankful or not wanting or, or really being extremely hesitant to help someone else, then people are going to be hesitant to help you. Of course, the Lord can move somebody to feed you anyway. But the point is, if we're actually going out there and doing the work that the Lord calls us to do, then yeah, he it'll be much easier to use those people whom you have helped to help you. That's why reputation matters. And no, not in a not in a cheerleader sort of reputation. I mean an actually good reputation. Where especially the reputation of you will not walk away from the truth no matter what the consequences may be. That alone, your stand in the faith can be enough to show people, like, oh, this is you know, what I see in the church is what I see everywhere. People that are very wishy-washy. But they see the strength of God in you and they're, you know, they're more willing to come to you. But, yeah, in Psalm 49, 6, and 7, you see it's a direct rebuke on those who worship, uh, worship their money. Why do you think Satan has his symbols on our dollar bill? Because he wants that worship. Uh, okay, let's also go to Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Amen. Esteeming the Lord. Don't brag or boast of self. Brag and boast of your Lord. Brag and boast of your king and what he has done. Brag and boast. Because you're not going to overdo it. Never, ever, ever can you overdo it. But there is something that stands out here to me. Where it says, The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. That is talking about the humble. There are, unfortunately, a huge number of people where you even bring up God. And they think you're shoving it down. Th you're, they think you're shoving your religion down their throat. 
or where good and holy conversation just causes certain people to feel uneasy. They don't want to be part of the conversation. You can actually see the devil pulling them away. No, not literally, but you know what I mean? Their, their discomfort at all the quote unquote God talk. And they just need to withdraw. They need to isolate. They need to go away because they just can't stand the goodness of God being part of the group. That is, that is a very evident token of where their heart is in that moment. So pray for them. If you, if you know anyone where they feel uncomfortable at talking about God any day of the week, not just Sabbath, but especially Sabbath, where they're just, ugh, they almost, they almost give off this uh, body language of disgust. Who, who else would move a heart to do that except the devil himself? So they may not think so. They may just say, "Oh well, I needed to go do do this," or "I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to interrupt," or "I don't blah blah blah." They'll try and make it sound as humble as possible. But bottom line, they don't want part of good godly conversation. And it, it's unfortunate, and that's why I really like that uh, that line in verse two: "The humble shall hear thereof and be what glad." They're glad to hear the boasting of what the Lord has done. They're happy. They're joyous. To see your joy at talking about what the Lord has done. Yeah, the humble in heart, which, you know, the Lord gave them that heart in the first place. They'll just be glad. And more about giving credit to God in Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. All things are on the level of dung. Poop! In the end. All things. Because if you... The name Beelzebub, the actual name of Satan, you know, in heaven, his, his heavenly name was Lucifer. So if you ever hear somebody saying, uh, Lucifer, that's not his name. It's not his name anymore. That was his name in heaven. Ever since he fell, his name is Beelzebub. The things like um, Satan, devil, those are, those are still names, but they're more like titles. His actual name is Beelzebub, and he hates that name. Because by definition, the name Beelzebub means Lord of the Dung. And the Lord describes all the wicked dead at the end of, um, at the end of Plague 7. They're scattered around the world like dung. And as Satan is wandering the world during those thousand years, he finally fulfills his name. Lord of the Dung. And that's why he hates it. His, his name alone is prophetic of what he uh, of what he's going to go through that's why he hates it that's why he prefers that people call him lucifer because it reminds him of the glory he once had but what's the point here all things our money our cars our houses our clothes our our pains our shames our guilt all of it is in the end expendable so long as we have Christ with us and in the end we spend an eternity with Christ then what does it matter what we lose now all things uh, all things should be taken care of while we have them right we should take care of our houses our cars we should take care of our animals we should take care of all the things which the Lord has seen fit to give us and we should love and cherish those things as precious gifts which God has given through his grace. Absolutely. But if a situation came up where we must walk away, then that's that. We should just walk away. But like people who run into a burning house to grab their TV, not even a person, risking their life for a box of lies, And so all things, all things are worth 
losing if it means we gain Christ. And if you think about the length of your life on earth, let's say you live to be 100 years old. What percentage of eternity is 100? It's incalculably small. So even by even from a rational point of view, um, if from a rational point of view, what makes more sense? To concentrate on the things of this earth, which are set to be destroyed, or to concentrate on the things of heaven, which are always and forever going to be eternal. And so give credit to God. Give credit to him. Make sure he's always receiving your praise. And if you're going to boast about anything, make sure you're boasting of him. And why, anyway? Why, anyway? Because wasn't it our hands that went to work to get this stuff and all that? Let's just read Colossians 1.16. Colossians 1.16 will give us a bit more clarity on why we should boast of the Lord. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. All things exist for him. You exist for him. The dust belongs to him as much as you belong to him. Your money belongs to him as much as your clothing and your food belong to him. And I know this can hit that really prideful part of our hearts. But, like, but this is mine. I own it. Look, this piece of paper says I own it. Well, he made the paper. He made the ink. He made the situation happen where you could have that thing, but it's not yours. And so that, is, that should be a humbling thing to realize that we don't actually own something. He gives us things, like he gave Israel the land of the Canaanites. You know, he gave it. All, the, all throughout the early books of the New Testament, you see that God gave it to them. He gave them their food. He gave them everything. Why? Because it's his to give, not for our, they're not ours to take. But it can really hit, it can really hurt our pride to even entertain the thought that what we have is not ours. And that's why the next thing in here, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, is love is not proud. And it's still verse 4. This will end verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, uh, in regard to love, is not puffed up. This is another way of saying love is not proud. As far as how the uh, this characteristic of love is also a character trait of God, uh, there are a couple of places where we can see this. In James 4, 6. In James 4, 6, it says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And this same sentiment is given in 1 Peter 5.5. 5. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. So that's that. God has, um, he has a serious problem with pride. He has a serious problem with pridefulness. And then and all that and just to um just to make it very very clear pride the word pride itself shows up in the kjv bible um a total of 49 times in 46 verses the word proud shows up in the bible 48 times in 47 verses and the word proudly shows up nine times in nine verses in total there are 102 verses in the bible that will either use the words pride, proud, or proudly for a total of 106 times. In all of those 106 times, in all of those 102 verses, there is only a single instance 
where the pr where the word proud is used in a positive sense. Otherwise, it's always condemned. It's where when speaking of the good the good works that a, uh, that a man can do for God and the happiness and joy and sincerity we have in good works, it is said that in, uh, how does it go? Like, God loveth the proud doer. But it was in the context of doing the work for the Lord. So it's not even pride in the sense that we're talking about. Pride is absolutely condemned in the Bible. So look at those bumper stickers that some parents have. Proud of my honor roll student. That's not a good thing to have. Not a good thing to have that there, but... Oh, so how does the devil justify pride in this world? When God strictly condemns pride, how does he... Uh, how has the devil framed it into... Framed pride in a way that makes it seem virtuous? Self-esteem. Self-esteem. Self-esteem is a mockery of the Lord. Self-esteem is seen as a virtuous thing. Like You should work on your child's self-esteem. You should work on yours. Give yourself positive affirmations every morning. No, no, and no. Don't give yourself positive affirmations. Instead, make a list of everything the Lord has done for you. Boast of Him, not of yourself. As far as those bumper stickers go, I'm proud of my honor roll student. I'm proud of this, proud of that. Where in the Bible does it say that that's okay? By all means, you know, uplift your honor roll student. Uplift them. They're putting in hard work. They're doing their homework. They're acing their tests or doing a good job. By all means, uplift them. But pride. Pride uplifts while also while also bringing low. You understand? Okay, so the still using the bumper sticker, I'm proud of my honor roll student. How does that make the parents who don't have an honor roll student feel? How does that make the, the children themselves who are not honor roll students feel? Worthless, helpless, stupid, idiotic, can't get anything right? Why do you want to cultivate that in someone else's heart just because you're so prideful over your own child? Pride doesn't make any sense. And pride is what led to the rebellion of Satan in heaven in the first place. So what about pride and country? Be happy that you live here. This is the greatest country to live in by far. You can be happy to live here, but why prideful about it? Believe me, I know what it means to be prideful, especially in country. The icky part about it is that it it brings, in at least in my mind, it brought other people to a lower level. Even other comparable first world countries, like huh, the British, like we could we could destroy them in a fight. Why was I thinking that way? Because pride in my country had me having a lesser view of other people. That's, th that's the terrible part about pride. That it has us thinking of, of other human beings as less than. Pride in all its forms. Except for the form of where we're happy to do the Lord's will. Pride in all its forms is um, something which separates us. Pride in all its forms will divide us. For, uh, for instance, in Galatians 6.3, Galatians chapter 6, verse 3, it says, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Again, Galatians 6.3, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So pride has us thinking we're actually better than someone else. And I don't care if someone's willing to admit that or not. Just think of how you think of others. All right, think of the sentiment toward Muslims. You have any idea how many people are using racial slurs? Things like 
no, I'm not going to use examples, but just like a backwards nation, you know, where, you know, brutal, are they brutal there? Yeah, but it's by their ideology. They themselves are still human beings. Those men still have mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. Those women have all the same. Aunts, uncles, grandparents. But we condemn them as people. Their ideology has turned them toward an, uh, an evil way of acting in life. They themselves are people. They are redeemable. But we condemn them. Where does God ever tell us, condemn them? No, he says to love them. He says to give them the good word. Don't be scared of what man can do to you. Because that's, a, that's another point of pride, right? I can't go talk to these people. They'll kill me. Like, well, yeah, and God said that the attitude of the lazy will be that there's a lion in the streets. I can't go out there. You saw that, you, that Paul and Jesus and the apostles several times just needed to take off. But not before giving the truth. They didn't let fear stop them from doing their job. It was after the fact, when the mobs were coming after them, that they had to, you know, they had to get out of there. But they gave the truth first. Fear didn't bind them into silence. They, um, yeah, they still did their job. But the point that we learn in Galatians 6.3 is don't think that you're better than other people. One of the ways we, we see this, especially in today's world, uh, let's go to Romans 12.3. And you'll see my point, hopefully. If not, we'll discuss it anyway. So, in Romans twelve, Romans twelve three, um, for I say through the grace given unto me to, let me start again. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So not to think of yourself more highly than anyone else, which leads to racism. Racism is one of the stupidest things that Satan has ever created, one of the most successful, but it's really, really dumb. Racism is, has been like the tool that's been used especially in modern times. When I say modern times, I'm really talking about the past few hundred years, but most specifically in the past like 50 or so, but most especially today. Racism is so ridiculous because there's no such thing as different races. If we were different races, we couldn't make babies together. We would be different creatures entirely. We couldn't make babies. And for, it's especially weird when somebody who believes in the Bible is racist. Like they believe in Adam and Eve and admit that we're all from the same parents, but still find reason to hate someone of a different color. The hypocrisy is immeasurable in that. To believe that we're all from the same human parents, but to still hate somebody because of their color. And you see it all over the place, on all sides, by the way. You hear a lot, you hear quite a number of white people talking about, uh, talking about blacks and Mexicans. You hear black people talking about whites and Asians. You hear it all over the place. The hatred goes from one end to the other, and it makes no sense. The only reason it makes sense is like this. There are, as far as lawmakers are concerned in the United States, there are around 545 of them. Not, um, not taking into account those who, um, like lobbyists and stuff. I mean, people who are directly in control of making law. There are only about 545 of them. There are over 350 million citizens of the United States. How are 545 people going to make sure 350 million people don't rise up against them. Have them fight each other. Democrats, Republicans, black, white. Sick them on each other's throats and they won't come after you. 
There's this one panel comic I saw a long time ago where the king and his advisor were on this really high part of the tower, right? And all the people down there, some had pitchforks, some had, um, uh, Torch. I seriously almost said fire stick. <laughs> some had torches, some had pitchforks. And he's saying to his advisor, what am I going to do? They're going to come after me. And the advisor says, don't worry about it. Just tell the people with torches that the people with pitchforks want to take their torches. Problem solves itself. They're going to be so divided against each other, they have no time to go against the rule, those who are ruling. And to really amp it up to make sure the people are fully divided and persuaded that, that they should be at each other's throats, you distract them with sports, you distract them with movies, you distract them with TV shows, magazines, you distract them with cars, you distract them with money, you distract them with all sorts of things. That's why 545 people in the U.S. are still there. That's why even though you see Democrats and Republicans arguing against each other, ever notice that it still goes in the same direction? No matter what, the arguments are for show. The arguments are not doing anything. It's that they're arguing to make you feel better. To make you feel like they're, at least one person is on our side. But no, nobody is on our side. Democrats and Republicans are two sides of the same coin. That's why they can argue like one point, gun control, right? They argue, they argue, they argue, and you still see that they're taking the guns away. In everything, it's moving in the direction of biblical prophecy. In everything, you see history repeating itself because their arguments are meaningless. They're for show. It's smoke and mirrors. So like people say, oh, uh, President Trump was actively helping Christians. No, he was helping Catholicism. Look at the version of Christianity he was talking about. That's not biblical Christianity. That's why he surrounded himself with priests. And his entire cabinet was filled with either um, open Catholics or those who were trained in a Catholic Jesuit institution like Georgetown University. Pride is what compels these people. The, the need to divide the people against themselves so that they themselves can stay in power and attain more power and wealth. It's all a show. It's all a circus. It, and, then, and then we're at each other's throats because we agree with one side, the other side agrees with the other side, but you don't see the politicians going at each other's throat, right? No, they leave that to the common people to kill each other, to rob each other. To destroy each other's property while they themselves are actually friends have you seen the pictures of like president trump and president obama they have fun together because they know it's a show that's why politics is politics is from the devil seriously if you look at the word itself poly means many and ticks means bloodsuckers Many bloodsuckers. Now that could, the, albeit that's just a play on words, but it's a, it's a wonder that the Lord who created language, you know, allowed that word to be part of our vocabulary. So yeah, you can crinkle your eyebrows and be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense all you want. Poly still means many and ticks are still bloodsuckers. So go ahead and fume. But so how can we actively fight against pride. For one thing, don't allow yourself to be separated from others by any sort of superficial divide, especially skin color. Seriously, that is, I know I've said it and it's, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe aggressive language, but racism is stupid. Of all the, it's the ma I heard it said this way before. The maximum amount of hate, the maximum racism, is the maximum amount of hatred for the least amount of reason. It's not like they even did anything to you. Not as a whole. But what's a what's another way we can fight against pride, especially the, well, pride is always about the self. Let's go to Philippians two verses two through eight. 
Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 through 8. Fulfill ye, <laughs> fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. <clears throat> Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The lesson here, be modest. Even our Redeemer, our King, our Savior, Jesus Christ, came off of his throne in heaven just to put upon himself this sinful flesh to suffer on our behalf, to die on our behalf, to face humiliation and shame on our behalf. And praise the Lord that, you know, Brother Austin was moved to sing from Isaiah 53, which told us everything that he would do for us. And yet, modesty seems to be something that's unthinkable in this world. What, is the, what does it mean to be modest anyway? It means to be unassuming or moderate, especially this, okay? Moderate in the estimation of one's abilities or achievements. Not calling attention to oneself through speech or, through speech or even in clothing, because dress reform is part of the Christian walk, right? Uh, what am I talking about? In 1 Timothy 2.9. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 9, it says, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So dressing modestly. And it's for men too. I'm not just picking on women, but modestly, the modest in the way we dress like things that are form fitting uh, i mean the things shouldn't be showing off our curves like especially not especially but men who have muscles like wear a looser shirt like, there's no reason that's just boastfulness that's pride be like look how ripply i am remember narcissism is a very real thing but being modest in everything and modest in the way we speak too, like we talked about earlier. A modest way of speaking kind of looks like this, giving the glory to God. Like if you've come out of sickness, it wasn't your medicines that helped you, though God certainly did provide natural remedies. A modest way of speaking is, the Lord has provided these things in nature to help me through this sickness, and he took the sickness away. That's a modest way of speaking. Wasn't the whether with or without the medicines, God will make the choice. And lastly, in here to go against pride, go to John thirteen. John chapter thirteen, verses fourteen and fifteen. John thirteen verses fourteen and fifteen. Jesus says the following, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. So don't be arrogant or overbearing. If the Lord himself is willing to wash, remember who Jesus is. The Lord of the universe, the creator of all things seen and unseen, the one who is most holy, made the decision to come off his throne, to put upon himself the sinful flesh, and show what it means to be humble, what it means to serve each other. He, the one who created the apostles and created the dust on their feet, humbled himself to get down on the ground and wash the feet of of his disciples. So who are we to ever say that washing each other's feet, that's, that's below me. I can't do that. Or to be so embarrassed at doing something like that, 
that we become that we go to a state of not being able to do it which you know as far as communion communion is concerned this is part of communion washing each other's feet is part of it and sooner rather than later we are going to start uh communion services and of course the devil's going to come and listen god is love right Everything Jesus did was from a place of love. He washed the disciples' feet because of love. He died because of love. He suffered because of love. So what is it? What is it called when we refuse to do as he did? Is it love? No, of course it's not. Now that said, whenever it is that we do... Uh, have our when we do communion services it's entirely voluntary entirely voluntary nobody is forced not the young not the old so long as you're baptized then communion is communion's for you now i'm not saying that it's going to that we're going to do it next week but if you know the lord can only throw so many signs in one direction so yeah, and the devil will try to say that's that's embarrassing, that's wrong, that's legalistic. Right? That's whatever. What I can say for certain is that according to the studies that we've already done about love and service and humility, then communion or whatever the excuses against it are, that's just pride. So that's not love. And so, and it's definitely not kind, which goes against love. But the point is, you see how deep love can go. And this is just our second installment of this. With every one of these things, we can have multiple discussions, multiple ser uh, sermons on them on their own. But I just urge everyone, as I have for a while now, Read 1 Corinthians 13 every morning. Let it be one of the chapters you read. That's just a recommendation. You don't have to do it. But if you want to learn what love is, read about it. If you want to learn how to do a proper push-up, you read about it. If you want to learn how to do anything properly, you study it. So if you want to learn about love, read 1 Corinthians 13 every day. And I guarantee you the Lord will work in you to teach you what it means to be loving and show love, especially to him. And so I hope and pray that everyone was blessed and for everyone on the phones, thank you for being here. Uh, before you go, if you can kneel, please kneel. We're gonna end in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this blessed Sabbath day. Thank you for teaching us what love is. But we mainly thank you for teaching us what love is by loving us first. If we just sit back and ponder and think upon all the ways you've shown us love, then, then we know exactly how to treat each other and we know exactly how to treat our relationship with you. And so, Father, work your love in us that we could show you as much love as possible today on this holy Sabbath. As best we can, we make these prayers to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.